Welcome back to another episode of The In-Between. This is where we talk about the passage that's in between what I preached last Sunday and what's coming this Sunday. Now, typically that's what we do, but because we've been going verse by verse in Hebrews chapter 11, talking about true faith, uh, there is no in-between verse to verse. Uh, So what we've actually been doing is, remember in Hebrews chapter 11, the author goes through several different lives of great men and women of faith and explains how these Things were great about them, but it was because of their faith in God. That is ultimately what is great about their life and how God gets the glory. So what we do is we look at that person's life, and then we go back into the Old Testament, the New Testament, wherever their life may be, and we take a look at what was the rest of the story. Give us some background. So, for example, the first thing that the author talks about in Hebrews chapter 11 is creation, that it was by faith we understand that all things were created by the Word of God. In the next set of verses, we learn about Abel's life and how Cain had killed Abel and Abel offered a sacrifice to God and it was approved and received, but yet Cain had offered a sacrifice and God had rejected it. You can go back and listen to last week's sermon if you would like to on YouTube, uh, possibly right next to this uh, episode, but go back and listen to that and it was all about leaving a legacy of faith and how beautiful it was that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the author had in Genesis written down saying that uh, the Lord looked at Cain and said, Cain, what is this that you have done? Your brother's blood speaks to me from the ground. But then we get all the way to Hebrews thousands of years later, and the author is using similar language, but saying that from beyond the grave, Abel's faith still speaks to us to this day, which is pretty cool. And so it was all about leaving a legacy. And then this coming week, we're going to be talking about Enoch's life. Now, Enoch was a very short story. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 5, starting in verse 21 and then going through verse 24 today. So if you want to go ahead and grab your Bible and open up to that. But it is this tiny little section about Enoch's life where we really don't get to hear a whole lot about him. We don't get to hear uh, who all of his family was. We don't get to hear who his wife was. We don't get to hear the exact location of his house. We don't see all of these things. All we find out about Enoch is that he walked with God. And so we're going to look at that a little bit further today and more so on Sunday. Sunday. But let's go ahead and read in Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. Now, as I mentioned, this very short story, it comes right in the middle or, well, more so towards the end, but in the middle of a conversation about genealogy. So after Abel was killed, how did Abraham's line continue on? Well, after Abel was killed, they had a son named Seth, and then we see the line of Seth going forward. Now, take a look at verse 21. Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. Now, that name might sound familiar, not Enoch, but Methuselah might sound familiar because a lot of people jokingly call someone who is old Methuselah because Methuselah is the oldest person ever to have known have, who has lived in history. And specifically in Scripture, he is the oldest person that we end up seeing in Scripture, living nearly a thousand years. So Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. And after he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was not there because God took him. Now, the rest of the genealogy ends up being, uh, you know, Jared had Kenan at such and such age, and then Jared lived another several hundred years or this many years, and then he died. It's always, he he lived, he fathered, he died. He lived, he fathered, he died. But then we get to Enoch's story where we get just a couple more verses, not just saying Enoch lived, he fathered, and then he died. But we hear this very clear statement in verse 24, Enoch walked with God. Then he was not there because God took him. Now, an interesting fact about Enoch's life, and really the rest of these guys' life, is that uh, they would have known Adam. Adam lived 300 years of Enoch's 365 years of life. So the fall, God 
the garden, the serpent, all, all of these historical things and why sin is in the world and why death separates us from God and how to follow God, all of these things are being passed on to the next and to the next and to the next. And Enoch would have lived in the same time period and known Adam. He is the, uh, I guess, seventh apart. So he's, he's the fourth so great, 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 great grandson of Adam, and that's pretty remarkable. But we see he fathered Methuselah at age 65, walked with God 300 years, and had other sons and daughters, and then Enoch's life in total was 365 years. So at 365 years, God came to him and said, you're not going to face physical death. I'm going to take you away from here. Now, there's a lot of speculation about Enoch's life. There's a lot that people like to try and say, but remember, we want to come back to the truths of Scripture. Now, a question kind of came to my mind when I read through this, and I thought, you know, this, this is a question that perhaps you maybe have faced in your life before when you're reading the Bible. You get to a section that's genealogy. As I said, they go through each guy's life. They say, he lived, he fathered, he died, he lived, he fathered, he died, and there's not a whole lot about them, so in our minds, sometimes we assume then that means there's nothing applicable from this. So why should we read the boring parts? Now, ultimately, we know if, if we really are having the right attitude about it that there is nothing boring about God's Word. God's Word is very precious, but let's also be honest with ourselves that we kind of look at genealogy stuff as boring. You may have been like me, where you've skipped over it before. Well, one of the reasons that we read the parts that perhaps are not as exciting to us is that all of God's Word is important and useful. When Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, he said, All Scripture, get that, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So God's Word is important and useful, whether or not we think it's important and useful. The other part of that is God can use one word to impact our lives. Whether the story is long or short, God gets the glory and our lives are better off by His Word. God is a master of language, having created language to begin with, but also He is the one with all the power so that even when, uh, so even, uh, when the creation of the world came together, it was by His Word. God spoke everything into existence. So that should change our mindset where we need to be viewing his word differently, even the parts where we might think it's a little slower, it has nothing to do with me. God's word is good, and it always has something to do with us. There is always timeless truths that we can pull from scripture and apply to our lives. That's the reason God provided it for us. So how how do we read through these boring parts that we might call them? Well, Number one, we do have to have the right attitude. If we approach it right away and go based off of other people's opinions of that book or that passage of Scripture, or we go just simply based off of, I began to read it a little bit and it got boring to me and then I stopped, that's not the right attitude to have about Scripture. But instead, if we keep that mindset of what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, looking at Scripture as being inspired by God and profitable, then that's the right kind of attitude that's going to allow us to have the proper perspective on God's Word and be looking for ways that we can glean from it and apply it to our lives. The other thing that we need to do, not just have the right attitude, but we also need to pray for understanding and application. God's own Word in Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. When we approach the Bible, it's not based off of how we feel about the Bible or how we feel about what is written right in that section and how we feel that it should be applied to us, but rather it's based off of the truth 
of Scripture. Now, having a right attitude, that's important. But in the same sense, we can't just sit here, and we shouldn't just sit here, trying to base everything off of our only measly, tiny little human brains and our understanding. If we are struggling to understand Scripture, or if we're struggling to find how that applies to our lives, then turn to the one who wrote it. Turn to God. Don't rely on your own understanding, but instead, trust in the Lord with all your heart. He's going to make your path straight, and He, as we read in James, if we seek His wisdom, then He gives to us ungrudgingly. The other thing we need to do, besides having a right attitude and praying for understanding and application, is also slow down. This is one that I know out of these several episodes that we've done of the in-between, this is something I remember specifically saying that we need to slow down. There are many times that we bite off much more than we can chew, and then that makes us skip over that gem that the Lord has provided right there for us. But then lastly, let's meditate upon it. In Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the psalmist says this, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, listen closely here, instead his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. That's a promise from God, from God's own word. So when we come to difficult passages or boring passages, as we're calling them today, and we we are trying to have understanding, we have the right attitude, we've prayed to God, we've slowed down, a great tool for you to be able to use is don't go on to the next thing, don't go on to the next passage, don't go on to skip over it and say, I'm going to go to something more exciting, but meditate upon that word right there. Let's let's go back here and read through this passage again. Let's have the right attitude. In fact, let's pray to God together. Heavenly Father, we come to you knowing that your word, even though it was written by human hands onto paper physically, you inspired that word. This is your word, and it is powerful. It's for us. It's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You are seeking to equip us. So will you help us understand and apply your word to our lives? Help us to slow down and continue throughout the week to be thinking on this passage that you have provided for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's read through it again. That's part of the reason that we give you a verse of the week so that you can meditate on that. So verse 21, Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. And after he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. This passage right here is going to be your verse of the week. So think about that just for a second. Take a look at it on the screen if you are able to watch. And after he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was not there because God took him. So what truth can we glean from Enoch's life? Well, number one, it's never too late. When we look at the very first verse here, it says Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. Now, I'm not saying, oh, it's never too late to have children. If you are 65 years old or you're 75 years old and you're still having children, in some ways, I'd like to just call you crazy. But what I am saying, it is never too late to turn to God and never too late to walk in obedience to God. This passage between verse 21 and verse 22, which is your verse of the week, suggests that he was actually not walking with God until after Methuselah was born. Notice the change in vocabulary here. He says, Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah, and after he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. After he had fathered Methuselah, he walked with God 300 years. Now, that's telling us and reminding us it is never too late to turn to God. It's never too late to walk in obedience to God. It's never too late for God to call us to do something in our lives. Don't look at your age. Don't look at your situation and be disheartened by that. 
don't discount or don't just assume that God is not powerful enough to take care of it or to have you be called out into obedience. God is powerful enough. If he can impact your life by just one word, think of what else he can do. God has the power to take care of that. So don't look at your age. Don't look at your situation and think it is too late for me. As long as you have breath and you have life here on this earth, it is never too late for you to follow God, to walk in obedience, and for the Lord to use you for his glory and the good of others. The other thing we can learn from this is that It's rewarding. So when you look at the last verse, verse 24, Enoch walked with God, then he was not there because God took him. God recognized these things, as we're going to be reading in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6 this week, that God is pleased when we seek after him, draw near to him, and walk with him. God was pleased with Enoch's life and approved him and took him away, gave him escape, rescued him from this earth and from facing physical death. Folks, I tell you, it is rewarding to follow the Lord. The other thing that we can learn is that children or major life changes are a blessing. Warren Warren Wearsby, uh, a pastor and a commentator. He's passed away now, but he points out that this passage, as we mentioned before, suggests that Enoch didn't walk with God until he became a father, but then he looks more so at that point and says there was a significant life change, and it impacted Enoch for the better amongst a world of an increasing darkness. Enoch all of a sudden became a father at 65 years old, but then also turned to God, So life changes, though they seem scary, there's a lot of unknown, and they can be very intimidating, can actually be used by God to better your life. It bettered Enoch's life. It was rewarding. It wasn't too late. But that should be considered a blessing. So you see how just a few verses can actually be applicable to our own lives. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember this verse of the week in chapter 5, verse 22, and meditate on it. Dwell on it. Be thinking about it consistently and reminded of the truth of God, that it's not too late, it's rewarding, and that life changes are a blessing. And after he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. But I also want to challenge you, and you've heard me use these two words in our own time today. Don't be disheartened and don't be intimidated. Don't be disheartened by your own situation or your age or anything else that this world may bring at you. He wasn't disheartened by the darkness of the world. Instead, trust in the Lord and realize it is not too late for God to use you and for you to walk in obedience with the Lord. But also, don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated by life changes. I, for one, absolutely hate change. I can't stand it. I love to eat the same things. I love to read the same things. I love to do the same things. I love to sit in the same places. I like change. We all like feeling comfortable. And sometimes we get really intimidated by big life changes to the point that it actually compromises our faith and makes us disobedient towards God. And we don't want to do that because we know it is rewarding to follow the Lord. So don't be disheartened. And don't be intimidated. Know that it brings joy to the Father, and it is better for your life to follow Him. Well, that wraps up our time here together today. Uh, This Sunday, as I said, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to be gone next week, so after I preach on Sunday in that evening, we're going to be flying up and seeing my parents for Father's Day, and then we'll be back by Wednesday. So if you only ever see me on a Sunday, you're not going to think that I was gone, but if you need me sometime during next week, just understand, be a little bit patient with me, but we're going to go celebrate Father's Day uh, because I love my dad and I'm incredibly thankful for him. There's a lot of life lessons that he's taught me, and I just I want to go and show him how much I appreciate him as well. Uh, so with that, we will see you here at Calvary Baptist Church in Dayton, Nevada at either 8.15 or 11, 11 a.m. If you would do me a favor, though, like this, subscribe to our channel, and then go tell a friend because somebody else needs to hear these truths as well and see what's in between. We'll see you guys later.